Thank you very much for being here today with us. I know it's a difficult uh, period with uh, Orthodox Easter and uh, the first day of May on Monday, which uh, makes uh, a good uh, bridge for hardworking uh, people who want to have a few days off. Uh, so we appreciate very much your being here. The uh, whole event is being uh, transmitted uh, through webinar, and we will be uh, receiving, hopefully, uh, some questions through webinar. But please be free. Since you are here, you have, of course, the first word. If you have questions to ask after the professor's uh, uh, presentation, please do not hesitate to do so. Um, I will just say a few words um, to set uh, the scene. The Ekaterini Laskaridis Foundation has uh, initiated a center for China studies, as we call it, together with uh, the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Uh, this was done uh, just prior to the COVID uh, uh, emergency, during uh, President Xi, Xi Jinping's uh, visit to Greece, official visit to Greece, and that is when we signed this uh, uh, center. Due to the COVID crisis, we have not done very much in uh, uh, the real world. We have mostly done uh, webinars and uh, conferences with uh, Chinese counterparts. And also the, the Ekaterini Laskaridis Foundation is uh, uh, supporting uh, a chair of uh, studies uh, in uh, the University of Tsinghua in Beijing. So we want to have a good connection with uh, China, the first reason being that uh, our president, Panos Laskaridis, builds at least two ships per year in China. So this is uh, one uh, uh, reason. And uh, another reason is that we believe that uh, understanding between uh, different uh, mentalities, uh, namely the Chinese and the European mentality, is very important if we want to, um, to, to make our living together in a world that is getting smaller by the year uh, in peace and prosperity instead of war and destruction as we are seeing these days happening in the Ukraine. Um, I have to say that we are very lucky at the Lascaridis Foundation to have uh, Professor Konstantinos Tsimonis uh, with us. He is assisting us very much in uh, organizing lectures as uh, tonight. And uh, we are greatly honored to have Professor Kerry Brown with us, but I will uh, leave Konstantinos Tsimonis to uh, say a few words about the professor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mazarakis. Uh, I'm very glad to, to welcome Professor Kerry Brown this evening to give uh, the fifth uh, lecture uh, in our series uh, on talks on China. Kerry Brown is a professor of Chinese studies and director of the Lao China Institute at King's College London. He's also an associate of the Asia Pacific program at Chatham House, an adjunct to the Australia New Zealand School of Government in Melbourne, and the co-editor of the Journal of Current Chinese Affairs. He's also president of the Kent Archaeological Society. I didn't know that about you, Kerry. And an affiliate of the Mongolian Inner Studies Unit at Cambridge University. Now, uh, Professor Brown, before joining academia, and he, he was in Sydney for many years, he was also in the think tank uh, world as a, a senior fellow and head of the Asia program of Chatham House. But he was also a diplomat, so he has served uh, at the British Embassy in Beijing. Uh, he was the head of the Indonesia, Philippine and East Timor section, uh, at the Foreign and Commonwealth uh, Office. So he has a very rich career. 
He has authored more than 20 books on uh, modern Chinese politics and has written for every major international news outlet. He has been interviewed by, by every major news channel, channel on issues relating to contemporary China. So without further delay, I will give the floor to you, Kerry. Okay, yeah, thanks very much for coming this evening. I really appreciate it, especially as it's a holiday, uh, and I appreciate the Foundation and my colleague, Dr. Uh, Simonis, inviting me uh, for my third visit to Greece. Uh, so it's a happy time to be here. And actually, my first travel abroad for two years <laughs> uh, because of the recent pandemic. So uh, this is the first living audience I've seen abroad, uh, so it's good. If I get a little bit scared and run away, it's because I haven't done this for a while. Um, China's position recently, of course, has been questioned because of the terrible war being waged in Ukraine by Russia. And I think it's raised much more dramatically what it is that China intends to do as potentially a global power. It's questions which are not comfortable. I suppose because at some point in the next 10 years, probably even sooner, we will all go to bed with China as number two, as the global, globally largest economy, and we will wake up the next morning in which China will probably be number one. And unless there's a huge economic disaster, and at the moment the Chinese economy is going through big problems, but so probably is everyone else, it's very likely that this will happen. And for the first time in modern history, a non-American European country, uh, I mean, certainly for the first time since the early 19th century, a non-European American, a North American country will be, in gross terms at least, not per capita terms, but in gross terms, the world's largest economy. But the symbolism of that moment is going to be very dramatic, and I don't think that we are prepared for it. What we will live in after that moment is a world in which the most successful capitalist is a communist-run country. <laughs> so this is an incredible, unexpected event. Quite incredible. We see uh, in a very, very many uh, areas now a kind of panic, a global panic. If you talk to American policymakers, European policymakers and politicians, I mean, they're really panicking and are convinced, many of them, that this is going to be an enormous challenge to our values, our way of life, that China will want to convert its economic power as number one into the kinds of power, I suppose, that Europeans and Americans, the way in which they use their economic powers, and that we'll therefore see a great kind of reversion, a great uh, reversal in which the enormously powerful Asia-Pacific with China at the centre will become the centre of the world and it will be a huge disruption. I am not entirely sure that it's going to really be as extreme as some people, you know, kind of fear, but I think it will be different. It's definitely a different world that we are moving in and it's happening very, very quickly. And I suppose what I really want to talk about in the next half an hour is uh, some ideas about how to engage with these radical and dramatic and unexpected changes which prepare us maybe a bit better. At the heart of that is a very simple question. What kind of power does China want? Not kind of, not, I don't think the question is what kind of power does China want to be? But an, another question, which is what kind of power does China want? I think it's pretty clear that it does want power. I mean, it would be very strange if it didn't want some kinds of power. 
But I don't really know that we understand properly what kind of power it actually desires for itself. And if I come back to the Ukraine-Russia example, China's power is distinctive because I think as a French philosopher, Francois Julien said, it's haunting but not acting. It's the power of passivity, of being passive, of being massive and ever-present, but not really actively doing the kind of things that are expected. Now, that is a very unsettling kind of power, and I think that that really does create a very um, big psychological worry. But I don't think it's... I mean, once you understand that this is the kind of power that China wants, I think you're more likely to be able to engage with it. With the issue of Russia and Ukraine, it is clear that um, politically, economically, China probably could put pressure on Russia. It's clear that its interests are probably not helped by what Russia has done in Ukraine. China had big investments in Ukraine. It got energy, some foodstuffs from Ukraine. I mean, the uh, invasion has clearly disrupted China's world in negative ways. It's clear that probably the only global leader who could really talk to Putin in Russia in a forceful way and not be rejected is Xi Jinping. And yet, I don't see any evidence that China is willing to do anything. Part of that, I think, is because maybe its long-term strategy is to have this kind of disruption, and in the long term it might serve its purposes. But I think it's also partly because more and more it doesn't buy into what it regards as the prevailing America-led Western uh, kind of consensus that somehow the world that was created from 1945, and which still exists in international organizations to a point today, was an unqualifiably good thing. China has become increasingly skeptical. And that, I think, dates from 2008, when it found that one of the few things it admired about America and Europe and their allies were our economic abilities, but that we proved in 2008 with the great financial crisis that, in fact, we were not particularly good capitalists. The dramatic impact and the long-term impact of the financial crisis in 2008 on attitudes by elite Chinese politicians to uh, the West, if I can call the West, I mean, like, a, a, do you know, a definition of the West would be all of those who voted for sanctions against Russia. <laughs> Okay, so that includes Japan, Korea, Australia, New Zealand, but it doesn't include all of Latin America, all of Africa, and all of the Middle East. Okay, none of those have imposed, as, I, as far as I remember, any sanctions. So the West is all of those who've sanctioned Russia. So in fact, we use that definition. I'll just talk about the West. I think China's attitude to the West broadly um, has become extremely negative and skeptical. And that has deepened because of political issues in the West from the election of Donald Trump in the United States to the signs of division in European and American communities. Uh, these are, I think, things that have made it lose faith in the fact that the people that probably thought knew what they were doing, at least economically and in some ways in governance, probably don't. It no longer has much admiration or any admiration for what the West stand for and what the West is. But I also think it regards us as hypocrites, as complete hypocrites. I mean, that's not my view, but I think that's what Chinese politicians probably think. Uh, so I think this is a big, big kind of um, transition that's happened very, very quickly in the last 12, 13 years. And it explains why, I suppose, China does not look at the Russia-Ukraine issue is one that it wants to get involved in because it just doesn't feel that it's its business. And it would only really get involved if Putin were to do something crazy like use nuclear weapons. And let's hope he doesn't. But I mean, of course, then, uh, yeah, then it would probably want to get involved. But until then, I think it is really doing everything it can to avoid getting sucked into our problems. I mean, it regards them as our problems. So if we think of Chinese power and what Chinese 
what kind of power China wants, I suppose we have to look at the evidence that the Xi Jinping leadership offer us. Xi Jinping has been uh, the supreme leader of China for uh, 10 years now, as you know. He will, sometime later this year, most likely, I mean almost certainly, be uh, kind of appointed for a third term as the head of the Communist Party. And the extraordinary thing for someone like me, and I know uh, Costas will probably have a sort of interesting view too about this, is we all know, I mean, if you've been to China, I'm sure you would appreciate this too, how complicated China is socially, economically. I mean, how complicated it is as a continental-sized economy, as an enormously complicated, you know, kind of social and cultural actor. How odd it is that we then have this very simple, focused, you know, kind of uh, domineering, centralized style of leadership. This is weird, because you would have thought, as everything else is becoming very complicated in China and has been increasingly complicated in the last 40, 50 years, you would have a more um, sort of representative and complicated leadership structure and political system. But over the last 10 years, we have seen almost every actor depart from the stage and leave only Xi Jinping sitting there. <laughs> this is very weird. I have followed Chinese politics for 30 years in the 1990s when Jiang Zemin was the dominant leader. You also had quite strong opponents and voices who were critical, people like Chao Shi, who was a fellow Politburo member, who were very critical. Um, you had other figures who were uh, you know, more on the left wing of the party, uh, Deng, um, I think his name is Deng Li Jun. Um, I always get him mixed up with the singer. It's uh, he was called Little Deng. He was one of the kind of leftist writers. Um, Deng, uh, sorry, Deng Li Chun. Deng Li Chun, who wrote very critical things publicly uh, in the in the mid 1990s. So there were voices which were allowed to speak publicly, which were critical, <clears throat> and I think the same was true uh, under uh, Jiang Zemin's successor, Hu Jintao. There were figures that could speak and could offer opposition. In fact, uh, Hu Jintao's premier, Wen Jiabao, uh, for, for a couple of years was promoting, it seemed, was promoting some kind of political reform uh, for the party. There were village elections, town elections, even at one point in the mid-2000s, um, elections talked about for positions in the Communist Party, which had never happened before. But under Xi Jinping, as China has grown more complicated, as its economy has grown larger and therefore more complicated, as its global position has become more complicated and has more issues with the world around it, we have a completely opposite kind of direction in terms of the political leadership. The story is all about one person now, which is very strange. I wonder why there aren't many any evidence really of, at least at the elite level, signs of some kind of opposition. I mean, these are complicated issues that leaders talk about. Why is it that there's so little that is actually kind of evidence of any big disagreements between leaders? Uh, although in the last few days there have been, you know, kind of some discussions of maybe some policy makers feeling that economic policy needs to change. This is not really as dramatic, anything as dramatic as the kind of disagreements that happened even under the all-powerful Mao Zedong, uh, you know, kind of 60, 70, 60, 50 years ago. So this is very strange. This is a big mystery. Why is it that this character has become very, very dominant? What is it that this is meant to kind of, you know, how do we um, interpret this? How do we make sense of it? For me, I suppose... I don't really look at Xi Jinping as an um, individual. I look at a kind of um, leadership tactics, a tactic of leadership in which his political function and role has a big symbolic importance. Symbolism in Chinese politics is extremely important. It's important in any politics, but in Chinese politics, symbolism is all important. And Xi Jinping is a symbol of something, and we have to work out what he's a symbol of. I suppose the first thing is that he's a symbol of um, a conviction and commitment to the absolute centrality 
of the Communist Party of China as an institution that is absolutely necessary for China to achieve its great strategic aim of being a powerful, strong country. I mean, these are not controversial statements. The desire for China to be a great, powerful country, uh, the fu, uh, fu qiang guo jia, you know, the, the, the wealthy, strong country, is a very um, long-standing desire. It's not something the communists created. It existed way, way before uh, in the late Qing dynasty. But the communists certainly have had a monopoly on delivering this mission in the last 75, uh, certainly since 1949, so the last 73 years. And it's, I think their argument that if you don't have unified, strong, central Communist Party rule, the great vision of a powerful, strong country will not happen. I suppose the second thing, therefore, is if the party is the carrier of this great mission, it must be unified. It must be disciplined. It's like a kind of state within a state. It must have a strong cultural identity. It must believe in its mission. Uh, and I think the Xi Jinping tactics, which again I know Costas has worked on, of cleansing the party, making it a political organization, not a semi-economic organization, ensuring that it's clear about its objectives, it's well-trained, it's actually kind of needing to believe in something. These are things that, from the day that Xi Jinping became leader, have been invested in and concentrated on. If you cannot have a strong Communist Party with unity and conviction and faith, you are not going to achieve the great mission. And Xi Jinping, therefore, operates almost like the Pope, or whoever is the head of the Orthodox Church here. You know, he's the kind of great leader who, from all, you know, all kind of symbolism and uh, the symbolism of power flows from him. And I think we should be very used as a, you know, kind of continent with a strong Christian tradition. We should understand the symbolism of that kind of power. Uh, it's very mysterious. It's almost uh, mystical. And Xi Jinping, in the way that he speaks, avoids commitments to specifics. I mean, the language he uses is a language rich in suggestiveness, uh, but it doesn't really commit to particular um, you know, kind of objectives. This is, I think, very distinctive of a, a kind of charismatic leader who has a, a kind of ability to create frameworks that people work in, but not to sort of tell them specifically what to do. So I think if you kind of use that structure as the charismatic leader with a strongly symbolic leadership, because they are linked to a mission to create a powerful, strong country, I think that kind of starts to make more sense, why the Xi leadership has had the sort of power um, and, the, uh, kind of and has been successful in the way that it has. But also, I suppose that that's been supplemented and made stronger by the very particular moment that China is in, in which the desire for its national mission to be a great, powerful country is, is very real. This is not abstract. This is not something 10, 20, 30 years you know, away. It's actually happening in front of people's eyes. It's partly happening because of the success of economic reforms in China, at least until recently, and it's partly happening because the outside world is not as strong as it used to be. So these forces complement each other and contribute to each other. The whole pace of China's delivery of its national mission to be great and powerful under the party has accelerated, and it has made it much more urgent, therefore, for a centralizing, highly symbolic leadership that talks about this great mission to do so with even more kind of conviction and even more um, kind of uh, strength. So in a sense, you could say that Xi Jinping is almost trapped in this narrative. We talk about China being a country with many political prisoners. Well, one of the most important, in fact, the most important political prisoner is Xi Jinping. <laughs> He's caught in this story. There is no exit from this story. Uh, it's pretty obvious to me, and we could probably talk about succession politics later if you're interested, but it's pretty obvious that 
I can't see how he can go. <laughs> I mean, you know, he might do what emperors like Qianlong and others did in the past where he, or Deng Xiaoping in more recent years, retires to some very important paramount leadership position. But I think he's embedded in the political structures of China today. He can't exit. This is very weird uh, that the Communist Party actually has never really been able to get away from this total addiction to a power and leadership structure where you just need to have a person there who is all powerful, like Mao, uh, who is able to guide this whole thing. And if they go, it's in jeopardy. And it's an interesting question. Were Xi Jinping, who is 70 next year, uh, to not be well, to have problems? What happens? This is actually quite unsettling. I mean, it would be quite a, an unstable situation. It would be very, very difficult. You probably also would think there's parallels between this and Putin in Russia. But China is a vastly more significant country. I mean, in economic terms and geopolitical terms, it will not be. I'm not saying that Russia isn't an important country and not able to cause enormous problems, which it's proving. But China being unstable would be an incredibly different proposition. So if we kind of look at the leadership structure of the Xi Jinping leadership, and if we look at the tactics and strategy, we get a kind of idea of the kind of power China wants, a power which is quite symbolic and is not probably the sorts of power that is expected. The narrative in European and American politics over the last few years of China being the great hidden hand is more often, I suppose, uh, about our fears rather than what China's doing. And one of the remarkable things that I've noticed, at least in the last five years, is how one of the reasons why, as Europeans, but probably as Americans too, we are, oh, we are so unsettled and uh, kind of uneasy with what we think China is doing is because we don't really know who we are. And China asks and has always asked in the last 500 years very deep questions of Europeans about who they are. From the first engagement in, I suppose, the 16th century, there was always this issue of how do you deal with a country which was profoundly civilized and profoundly admired by some of the key figures in Europe, from Voltaire to uh, kind of um, Leibniz to you know Max Weber, the sociologist. This is a long list of people, you know, Hegel, who saw many reasons to kind of look at China and admire the Confucian meritocratic system, but who were also obviously uneasy by the fact that the underlying values of that system uh, were not shared and that particularly European values and Enlightenment values as they became seemed to kind of be disputed or contradicted by a China which, for many who looked at it from afar, seemed well-governed, seemed fairly kind of, you know, strong in its identity and its culture and the integrity of its culture, but which did not share European values. And I guess this is very, very striking. I, I say to you, um, this is like four or five hundred year old story, but I don't see any big difference between that story and the story today. <laughs> you know, suddenly we have a kind of really big quandary because over the last 30 years, obviously, there has been, a, I suppose, an assumption that engagement with China would be economically to lead to political changes. I think, you know, in the, 40, in the 80s and 90s, America and others, Europeans, probably did believe that an economic engagement um, would mean a China that got wealthier and that was then going to politically reform. And Xi Jinping has been the remover of that myth. We should thank him. You know, we should be very thankful. He has helped us understand that this is not going to happen. This is not really what we're going to see. We're not going to see, um, you know, we, we may see changes in China. We will not see the kind of changes that we expect. And I think that that's a really important lesson. So uh, I guess if we can kind of get ourselves to the position of understanding uh, that our principal hopes of China's political change were um, wrong, we can kind of think about, therefore, a world in which when we accept that, what sort of space is there for China? 
uh, and the kind of power it wants. Uh, if we kind of deal with the issue of China wanting to come and radically change us and our mindsets, which I think is unlikely, I don't see any big evidence for that, I am happy to be corrected, but I don't see any big evidence, well, what sort of power have we got? And what problems will that power bring? One thing I suppose is that uh, it's quite likely if China is the kind of power that I'm talking about where it's more interested in symbolism and less interested in real kind of interventions which don't have direct uh, meaning and interest you know, for its own interests, if it's accepted as being a very self-interested power, our biggest problem is not China's actively wanting to engage in the world. Our biggest problem is China being passive and not engaging. I mean, this is not probably what we hear a lot. We have enormous investment uh, in think tanks, particularly in Washington, but also elsewhere, uh, in the idea of China being an active threat. But I think if you look at China being, in fact, the opposite of that, and an active um, a threat because it is inactive, this is actually a very hard problem to deal with. Because, I mean, at least if you are dealing with someone who actively is coming and trying to, you know, do, you know, kind of do things with you, you can kind of negotiate. But if you're dealing with someone who's passive, well, what do you do? <laughs> if you stir them into action, you might actually end up with a completely different problem. You, you really can see that this is, this is a very difficult issue to deal with. In the last 30 years, I would think our biggest problem has not been to deal with Chinese interventions and Chinese activism. As a diplomat, I would say my experience was our biggest problem was to make China engage and get involved. And that was always the issue when it was active in investments in Africa or when it was active in, you know, kind of international organizations. It was really difficult to get China to involve itself more unless there was a very clear economic outcome in the World Trade Organization. That was probably a good example. So this sort of passive power is a different model. It's a different kind of structure, and it needs a different sort of response. And it means, in fact, that panicking and kind of seeing China's activism in places where it probably isn't is going to be our problem, not China's. We are fighting against ourselves. We are in a psychological war in which it probably suits China that we are panicking and it probably suits China that we think it's more active than it is because we are looking at shadows. We have no criteria to understand what it is that this passive but huge power is trying to do. We look, for instance, at its, in, it's, in, its investments and we see narratives of it trying to control and do things which are probably... Um, kind of flattering it and making it seem much stronger than it probably is. When we look in the detail of the Belt and Road Initiative, for instance, and the kind of projects that it's been involved with in Sri Lanka, on Tanzania and other countries, and here in Greece, do we really see a country uh, and a government that is coming and really proactively trying to change mindsets? Or do we see, in fact, a power which is enormously important and has a lot of assets but is more of a problem because of its, mis its being misperceived and not being willing to spell out what it actually wants. And the bigger problem, I suppose, is that when it does spell out what it wants, because of the very symbolic language that it uses, as we've seen with the Belt and Road and the language that's come from Beijing over the last few years, this creates even bigger problems. So I suppose my conclusion will be that a lot of when we talk about, and I wanted to really kind of make this point, a lot of what we talk about when we talk about what China wants comes back to us. We're the ones that are trying to sort of articulate what we want China to want and how we engage with China in ways in which it does things that fit into our frameworks and our expectations. The one thing we don't do is actually play along with the idea of what its expectations might be and how we can work with those. This seems to be a very offensive thing when you say that you maybe should, uh, as a kind of policymaker, think of how China could lead certain issues and we could do things in ways which maybe accord more with China's passive and sometimes highly kind of um, 
it's not reactive, but a highly unreactive kind of uh, uh, posture. This demands a kind of mindset change for uh, those who are dealing with China. One of the things that I guess I've learned in the whole COVID pandemic is that there are countries that are able maybe to do this, uh, are able to think in a slightly different way and to kind of work with the kind of symbolic, passive power that China is uh, and maybe be fairly self-centered in the way they respond to. I mean, if you look in the Asia-Pacific region, you can see some examples of this. You could probably cite Malaysia as one of them. You could probably cite, uh, you know, kind of Vietnam even that has a very difficult relationship with China. Uh, being able to kind of just work with it and tolerate the fact that you're dealing with a very egotistical country where the problem is that you're always having to say how great it is without actually needing it to do anything to help you. I mean, these are sort of different ways of thinking. And the problem, I suppose, for policy makers in Europe and America particularly is that they are intrinsically activists. They're always wanting to demonstrate the success and active outcomes of their policies. And the idea that a policy that doesn't lead to anything could be a successful policy is often very odd. When I was a diplomat and a, a policy maker, I always remember this idea that there had to be measurable outcomes. But most of the time, you're dealing with issues that are so complicated that probably the best outcome is that nothing happens. And actually, I could say in the referendum five years ago in the EU for Britain, if nothing had happened, that would have been a happy thing. So, you know, sometimes nothing happening is a good thing. But I suppose that policymakers don't um, like that culture. They don't really like the culture of just working with things and not having kind of very activist outcomes. I don't think, therefore, it's going to be easy to work with China in the years ahead unless we really radically change our mindsets. And I don't see the political appetite for that at the moment. We will just have to get used to this era of psychological tensions, and we will have to get used to this era in which there is no consensus on what seems to be a pretty simple question, which is what kind of power China is and what sorts of power it wants, those questions I talked about earlier. It's likely that what I've said today, for some people dealing with this issue, particularly in think tanks in America or elsewhere, would be very hard to understand. They wouldn't see why we should concede, why we should just you know, allow China to kind of have this space. But I think that it's pretty clear that you can't uh, deny China space. I mean, as the world's biggest economy, that will be impossible when it happens. That There are all sorts of issues from climate change to dealing with pandemics to dealing with global security where China's involvement is necessary, not preferable, necessary. And that it is no kind of, I mean, a, a global order in which a fifth of humanity is not included is therefore not a global order. I mean, if you want a global order, which is what, of course, Westerners say they want, you're going to have to find some way of dealing with a partner that does not accept the underlying philosophy and values that you believe, but that you have to work with. This is no, I can't see any way around this. Otherwise, you have a global disorder. Necessarily, you have a global disorder because you have clear division. I think this will eventually be possible, that we will be able to create this kind of two-track world, uh, that it would at least two tracks. But it's the problem is, of course, that these changes are happening so quickly that the mindset changes that need to happen to deal with this are just not able to keep up. I guess what we're moving then is into a world, you know, we're moving from a bungalow to a two-story house, uh, and that's perfectly fine, but most accidents happen on the stairs. This will be a golden age for diplomacy because we're going to have to service the sort of extraordinary dialogue every day. It's going to be extraordinarily difficult, but I think it's manageable. But I don't think that this is remotely a situation where we could look at someone ultimately prevailing. And the language of the idea of a, a new Cold War, there will be no winner. I mean, this is not a kind of issue where there will be a winner. Uh, or a, the, the main thing is that there shouldn't be a loser. On that note, I think I will uh, be happy to hear your comments and uh, questions and any other kind of uh, ideas that you've got. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Professor Brown. I will use my privilege as chair to, to throw in the, the first couple of questions. And please, uh, if you have uh, any thoughts, even very raw thoughts, uh, I welcome you to, to share them with us. Um, so first of all, so I have noted down three questions. Uh, and there is this one question that, uh, that, that, that I'm dying to ask um, about British politics because you talked about the mindset. So we see that almost the day after the Brexit referendum, the Tory party, uh, the Conservative party, uh, created this China research group and has tried to, to steer the, the debate on China and the UK in a very negative direction. Um, what's your comment on that? I mean, why do you think they, they chose to uh, to, to focus on China as a, as a threat or as a competitor at a time when the leadership only talks about, about global Britain. So can really be a global Britain with very problematic relations with China? Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Britain's relations with China have always been integrated into Britain's relations with Europe. And I mean, a lot of our history has usually been in partnership with Europeans um, from the 16th century and the Dutch, uh, where we worked with China on trade, to um, the colonial era when the French and Germans were also involved. Uh, and of course, for the 43 years that we were part of the European Union, uh, a lot of the more difficult issues and trade negotiations were done through the European Union. So actually, Part of the challenge that Britain is in now is that, to be honest, we've not had a China policy that we've had to create ourselves for at least, I don't know, 50 years, but probably far longer. I mean, I really wonder whether we had a China policy, um, we had a Hong Kong policy, because Hong Kong obviously was of direct interest when we were, uh, you know, the colonial masters, but really a China policy I don't think we've had in modern times. So part of the setting up of these groups is to try and create that. Um, and, you know, kind of there are, uh, there are big divisions between the very negative and critical voices. There are others that are, you know, probably more um, kind of China favor, you'd say China friendly. But that whole kind of binary language, you know, of being anti or pro-China, I guess is just a big, big problem because you're dealing with a very complicated issue with language which is not fit for purpose and with an approach which is not fit, fit for purpose. Um, you can say that you're unhappy with the way that China, for instance, conducts its affairs in Hong Kong. Um, you can say that you're very unhappy with the way that China conducts its affairs in Xinjiang. But you can't say, therefore, that you are able to discount, you know, or, or disclude China completely, because, of course, in climate change and other areas, it's much more of an ally, and that's a probably, you know, kind of you know, this is a big problem, you know, that, that that for really important issues, the UK and China, like Europe and China, are allies, but there are other issues in which we don't agree, and the question is balance. Where do you put the balance? Where do you put the emphasis? Uh, at the moment, I think it's very impractical to obsessively look at some of the more negative problems which exist, I accept they exist, of course, but not see the bigger context. The context is all important. I mean, context is the key thing. And I think the group that you're talking about and others, of course, if they obsessively look at particular issues about this particular country, China, it will look pretty terrible. But if you put them in a bigger context, Politically, in Britain, like anywhere else, they are, um, yeah, I mean, they just look transformed. They look, they look completely different. Thank you. Now I would like to invite questions from the audience. Yes, please. And then wait for the microphone. Mm. First of all, thank you very much for, for your talk, Professor Brown. It was very interesting. And thank you, Professor Simonis, for organizing this. I have 
two questions. And the first one actually links the end of your talk with the beginning of your talk. Because you, went, you started putting the example of Ukraine and then you ended up by talking about global order. Um, and you said that China wants to be a symbolic power, but at the same time, when you, um, when you contemplate the priorities or the, the red lines that the CCP always uh, has in, in domestic and foreign policy, sovereignty and territorial integrity is one of them. It's always a red line for them. And this was obviously violated by Russia when they attacked Ukraine. So to reconcile, reconcile this normative uh, prior that China has with its foreign policy, I guess that it was a bit um, confusing or even schizophrenic, what you might say. So this would point to the fact that China doesn't want to be a normative power. But it's, if it's the biggest economy in the world, where does that lead the global order? And you use the metaphor of, of a bungalow, but this means that someone is upstairs and someone is downstairs. Does that have some, some kind of meaning? Um, that, that will be the first question. And the second one, when you, I would like to ask you to reflect a bit more about succession, because we will have this Congress in, in the Ottoman, we will have the biggest renewal in the CCP's history, I would say, the, the you, more young people will come to the high ranks. Will, is it possible that we will have cheese substitute um, in scope very soon? Mm. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, on China as a normative power, not being, not wanting to be a normative power, I mean, I guess the problem is if, what it won't want is a vacuum, okay? I mean, and um, I, I guess there's a question of whether you actively want to be a normative power or you become a normative power because that's the position you're forced into, right? I mean, if, if China is asked to make rules, uh, I mean, I'm sure it will do that, you know? I mean, if there's um, chaos in the region and, you know, it's got to kind of step in and do things, probably it would for self-interest. But that's not really what we mean by a normative actor. You know, it's sort of a normative actor because of utilitarian reasons, not because it believes in, uh, you know, observing universal rules. And I think that's something we've learned about China in the last, you know, 15 years, that it actually can involve itself in normative entities and international organizations and be a fairly convincing actor, but it clearly doesn't believe in their underlying values and principles, which is quite unsettling. I, I mean, it's sort of like an actor coming along and you know, play acting, and then you realize, my God, this is not authentic behavior. Um, so it's a big question. What does a world look like where in many ways it could be so unstable that China has to be a normative actor? I mean, this is very weird, but it's possible. I mean, it's possible. Um, on succession, I, I mean, it would be um, strange if no one appears when the new leadership are announced later this year, who doesn't look like they might be a successor. But, <laughs> I, I mean, it's just um, no one at the moment, I mean, there's, no, th th there's only a very few people that you could really consider who, who would have the experience. I mean, people like Wang Yang or Hu Chunhua. Um, I mean, these are figures who've got a lot of executive experience. Um, you would imagine that they're the ones that might be able to kind of step in, uh, you know. But they are not remotely close to the kind of status of Xi. And, you know, kind of if there's going to be a sort of um, transition for Xi to being a paramount leader, and then, you know, someone kind of takes over. First of all, the history of that happening under Deng Xiaoping in the 80s was not a good history. It didn't really work. And secondly, in this system, I mean, any possible sign of someone, you know, kind of building up opposition, it seems, is not regarded kindly. You know, this, this is not um, a system where people feel secure. And Xi Jinping, you know, is probably fairly paranoid because of the sort of way this system is. So I don't see any real clue 
at the moment to what a success. I don't know what a succession to Xi Jinping would look like. Uh, and I'm, you know, if there is a very, very clear kind of commitment to a couple of figures in 2000, you know, later this year, then I guess that kind of gives you a bit of a route. But at the moment, it looks like this leadership is going to go on and on and on. Good. I think we have questions from the lady, the audience, and we also have a, a question. Uh, on um, so I would online. also like to thank you for the, all the information you've provided us with. And I would like to comment, um, you've said, and as we know, China is uh, the most uh, fastly growing uh, powers in the world right now. So uh, I, was, I was always pondering upon uh, what has contributed to uh, this process we know it's, it's economic growth and the technological growth, uh, but as regards to the uh, passive, uh, being passive, maybe this could be an advantage for China. Has this contributed to it being uh, um, the power that it is becoming? And how you've, you've also mentioned that the, uh, this is a problem for, my, for us. Could you like add some uh, comments to this, how this could be a problem for us? And uh, is this an advantage for China and a problem for us? So this is my mm. Yeah. Um, how did China get to, to, to sort of successfully, you know, how, what are the secrets of China's success? <laughs> okay. If I knew that, I would go and do it back in London. Um, I guess you could say, first of all, it um, made a strategic decision in the late 1970s to focus on just building up its material wealth and power. And I mean, that's very simple, that sounds terribly simple, but the commitment to that was um, you know, so strong and so um, kind of unified, I suppose, that it, it, it kind of showed that the Chinese leaders believed if they were wealthy, they would be powerful. And they were right. I mean, the root of power is wealth, right? I mean. No, no controversy about that. The second is that they also worked out to, to not make America feel uncomfortable and angry until later. Um, they, I think, were quite wise in doing uh, this in ways which, at least until recently, didn't seem to directly threaten America and engage with America and, and you know, kind of meant that America did not become... Uh, too panicky, and again, that's changed now, but probably too late. You know, there's nothing America can do now, it's too late uh, to, to stop China, you know, being dominant or, or being much more dominant than it ever was. Um, third, luck, luck. I mean, it's, it's, it's grown to be where it is in a period when broadly uh, the international context was relatively peaceful. Uh, you know, there weren't huge kind of, certainly in the Asia-Pacific region, not huge conflicts. Um, so I think that that's, it's been lucky. Um, fourth, it's, um, I think, been um, able to learn from the terrible, terrible example of the USSR. So you could say in many ways the textbook of Chinese political and economic development is basically very simple. It is to do everything the opposite to what happened in the USSR. So don't put all of your GDP into military stuff because you just bankrupt yourself. Don't let the military get over powerful because they end up screwing up your politics. Um, make sure that the party is never threatened and has control over all parts of society. Um, and never listen to interfering busybody foreigners who just want to come and basically give you terrible advice and then basically you know, take no responsibility. I think that's what it's learned from the 1990s in Russia. So all this language about China and Russia being limitless friends, yeah, I mean, I think for Russia, it's limitlessly in admiration for China, and for China, it's limitlessly pitying Russia. You know, I think there's not, that's the two limitlessness. I don't think it's an equal relationship at all. It's not equal at all. Uh, and I think that's something that suits Russia, uh, uh, China. Um, I mean, why should we be worried? I mean, um, it depends on how committed. I mean, it, this is an individual choice, right? I mean, if you're committed to a, a, a view of the world where um, enlightenment, uh, democratic values that, that are um, meant to be uh, kind of, uh, you know, conducted in Europe and America in particular and, and elsewhere, 
If you think that they are the best, this is a worrying situation because you have an enormously important player who does not believe that. Uh, if you don't, if you think that pluralism is more important and that a diverse and pluralistic world is one that we can live with very different partners, and not just China, but India, with its very different form of democracy, then you're not worried for those reasons. You're probably worried uh, because there are significant political vested interests in America and Europe to, to make this a problem. You know, I mean, that's also uh, you know, kind of worrying that uh, for many American politicians, the only thing that really unites them uh, with, with their opponents is dislike of China and fear of China and anger at China. Uh, and that, of course, can cause problems because America is still a hugely important player. Uh, but I mean, for China and what it will do in the global future, I'm, I mean, worried? I don't think I'm worried. I'm kind of, um, in some ways, it's quite exciting. Uh, in other ways, it's going to be very challenging. But look, I mean, if you're studying China, these are the golden, you know, this is the golden age, right? Everyone wants us. <laughs> you kind of never, never end up, you, you know, kind of people really want to know about this. So for me, I'm pretty happy with it. <laughs> we have a couple of questions from the online audience. So the first one, okay, I, let's take first the two online questions and then I'll uh, we'll have one from the live audience. So by Mr. Uh, Pursalidis. Uh, dear Professor, how do you see the struggle between China and the U.S. in the diplomatic field? Uh, specific, starting from the statement by the Chinese official, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, about the U.S. being, the mal being malign and the EU just holding the candle. The EU called a... the, the EU just holding the candle. All right. For uh, the, um, the, the, the American... Yeah. Um, Look, I mean, the language that, the language that uh, Chinese spokespeople at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs use in recent, the recent two years has been pretty um, extreme. Um, <clears throat> I suppose um, I wouldn't take a huge amount of notice of it. I mean, it, I think it's a symptom of a deteriorating relationship for, four, for, for sure. For sure, it is a, um, a symptom of that. But... The underlying kind of issue is that China and America have to work with each other. I mean, they, they, have, they have no choice, right? So all the language that you hear, um, which is very angry and very divided, and <coughs> it's like a performance, you know. And at some point, the performance might become real. I mean, Kevin Rudd, the former Australian prime minister, has written a recent book about how it's perfectly possible that there will be war between China and America. But... <laughs> I mean, that's a war once more, if it were ever, and, you know, hopefully that will never happen, but if it were ever to happen, it's a war that neither side would win, right? I mean, I can't see what is, you know, who, who would prevail out of that. So, you know, kind of this fundamental fact of two nuclear powers with enormous economies who are very integrated into each other, who depend on each other, who are trying to solve the similar issues of climate change and, uh, you know, kind of sustainability... I mean, these are very compelling facts that show that they have to work to, or they have to work with each other, whether they're happy or they're unhappy. They have to work with each other, um, and so I, I kind of don't listen to that language very closely. Um, of course, we can't underestimate how politicians can misjudge things. Um, it is worrying that in China, Xi Jinping does seem to have all of the influence and power. And we have just seen a similar situation in Moscow where an all-powerful leader has made a pretty terrible decision. And it's worrying that this could happen in China. I mean, that Xi Jinping will have no one say to him, you know, this invasion plan you've got for Taiwan is a terrible idea. I mean, this is kind of quite worrying because this is one person will make this decision. Um, so, uh, you know, kind of... A dependence on one almighty leader is a huge vulnerability. Now, I'm assuming that there's a sort of uh, consultancy and whatever, you know, kind of official system in China where there's all sorts of incredible advice and stuff going to the sort of leadership and, and she and, and... But that's a big assumption. I don't have any evidence for that. I mean, it's perfectly possible that he could just make a decision 
and it would be a really, really disastrous one. So that's not reassuring. That is really, really worrying. And another question which relates to a term you used, and I believe it's going to be the title of your next book, uh, passive power. So you described China's passive power. So the question is, uh, I would like to ask about the absence of China's intervention in international developments. Do you believe that China wants to convince the West and in general the world uh, for its moral superiority? And if so, how will China uh, get legitimacy as a global leader uh, and get considered as a faithful hegemon if it does not intervene in situations like Ukraine? Well, I suppose China would say that intervention is not the route to getting moral credibility and that intervention causes more problems than you know, it solves sometimes. Um, and I think its view would be framed by the interventions of predominantly uh, European and Americans in the Middle East, which have been very, very uh, disastrous in Afghanistan, which I think is another enormous example for China of how you can spend a trillion dollars uh, and be there for nearly 20 years and end up with nothing. I mean, I think China would look at that and say, this is you know, proof that intervention is um, a greatly overrated action. Um, so I think the answer to that question is that China wants a totally different kind of setup where the question of intervention being a route to credibility and legitimacy is not one that it feels is... Um, it doesn't need to do that. To non-intervene is also right. I mean, this is obviously very difficult, but I think we have to be very conflicted when we look at interventions in the world now and how often they have gone badly wrong. Um, I think we, I'm more sympathetic to China's view, although, of course, when you see horrifying things happen during wars in Ukraine, you wish that China would do more. But I also understand that when China looks at the Middle East in the last 20 years and sees how badly interventions have gone and created more problems than they've solved, I think that's what's changed its view. We have changed China's view. I don't think it had that view before necessarily, but we have changed China's view because it thinks that we failed to do what we said we would do. There was a question at the back. And I think I, this can be that the last question for today. Are there any? Oh. I see more questions. Are you okay, Kerry, yeah, to take yeah. a few more? Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for your lecture. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, if I understood uh, well, uh, you said that uh, Xi Jinping transforms the Communist Party into a political organization rather than a techno-economical uh, one. My impression is, my impression always was that inside the party and besides its status as a political party are represented both a move towards liberalization of the economy and the will of the state and the party controlling the economy. Is it true? Is it true now in time of Xi Jinping's leadership? And my second question is, how, if you know how, the Communist Party, the leaders of the Communist Party of China, uh, understands the, the word uh, uh, hegemony. Uh, is uh, moral hegemony uh, uh, understand uh, an inspiration of Gramsci, of Marxist tradition, or from Confucius, from the Chinese tradition? Yeah, look. This, um, the Communist Party of China is 100% political, and economy is a political tool. So, you know, the, the, in Xi Jinping's head, the idea that you, you might kind of have a preference for the economy or, or you know, the politics, no, this is, not, this is not a division that's seen. It's politics. Everything is politics. It's to feed into the power of the party to create the great nation state, right? So, so, so... I don't think that this is a question of if this is, you know, kind of that the party has been made into this political organization that looks at economics as a political tool. This is a reality. It, it's, you know, Xi Jinping does not talk about the economy a great deal. Um, the only problem currently of a weak economy is the political issues it leads to. You know, it's not about creating wealth so that people can be wealthy. It's about creating wealth so that people can 
deliver with the party a, a great, powerful nation state. Um, I didn't quite understand your second question. What was the second question? How, the party... How does the party understand hegemony? Um, so the party says it's critical of hegemony, doesn't want hegemony. And I think, again, that's probably true. It's happy with a world in which its symbolic power is respected, understood. It is influential where it wants to be influential, but it doesn't want to go marching into issues from the Middle East to Latin America to Africa where it is expected, like the United States and its allies, to solve problems. It, it will only get involved if those problems relate directly to it. Uh, you could argue that that is not sustainable when you're number one, that China will have to get involved and create a kind of interventionist idea, you know, idea. but I think it will be deeply resistant and I think it will probably be a ineffective interventionist because I think it's it just doesn't want to do this kind of stuff so I don't think it's really into I, I, I think it sincerely doesn't want hegemony except in its self-interest um, first, first of all I would like to thank you for your nuanced presentation and um, I have to comment on how the West views China and I think that Part of the West sees China as a threat ideologically. Um, uh, the West, uh, I think, that views and treats China uh, like a boogeyman, like they viewed Soviet Union, for example. Um, even though China is very different, has a very different um, set of values, and uh, I would like to ask if China sees ideology as something important in the uh, long-term view of themselves as a big power? Well, <laughs> it's a huge question. I mean, I don't think it regards its ideology as something that we're going to want to adopt. Uh, and I, I mean, I don't see any evidence that Xi Jinping thought for the new era is very popular in Britain or Greece or anywhere else. So I, I don't think it's... Um, you know, it, it, it's not in the business of exporting its ideology... I think it's probably keen on its culture being understood and recognized as powerful. And I think the political importance of culture, of the Chinese way of doing things being distinctive, authentic, and something that is Chinese, that that's meaningful, is, is something that Chinese leaders believe in. But ironically, the very fact that it is so distinctively Chinese means that we, who are, non who are not Chinese, clearly, can't adopt that. I mean, this is, you know, we can't all become Chinese, right? I mean, it's uh, more than just a cultural issue. I mean, it's a linguistic issue, an ethnic issue. Uh, so I, I don't really kind of think, when we look at the structure of the way that Chinese identity and culture and politics relate to each other, the curious thing is not that it is promoted in the outside world as something that that world can embrace. The weird thing is it is created so that we cannot embrace it. So I'm very puzzled why so many people think this is an ideological threat. I have worked in China for 30 years on and off. I have worked in party schools, lecturing. I have dealt with Xi Jinping thought, Deng Xiaoping theory, uh, Hu Jintao, you know, scientific development. I would love to have said at a single moment I could believe in this stuff. I don't believe a word of it. So if I have, you know, I've been saturated. I've looked at it like Costas here, you know, and I, I, I couldn't believe it, even if I tried. I couldn't believe it. It's, it's something for others. This is a problem, and I don't think we should worry about it wanting to promote those. We do need to worry about the fact it's excluding, uh, you know, many ideas which we can't actually embrace because they are excluding us. That's a different problem. Well, yeah, we, we see that in climate change. There's a functional relationship. I mean, it's intensifying. We see it in 
many collaborations in areas from the management of the pandemic, for instance. I mean, there were collaborations, though they didn't lead to a joint vaccine, but there are collaborations in many different areas of research, some in our college, King's College London, and there are enormous areas of collaboration uh, historically in artificial intelligence. There's in enormous collaboration in, in, in economic areas. I mean, there is plenty of eco, you know, kind of re, re examples of collaboration um, and, and dealing with each other. The, the question is, at what point this becomes the norm across a whole you know, bunch of areas? So we can say that it's likely that that won't happen, that we're going to have to make strategic choices about where we engage and where we no, don't engage. And the point of strategic choices is that <clears throat> where we don't engage will have costs. We will have to deal with costs. For instance, we won't want to deal with China on some areas of research where it may well create things that we want, and we won't be able to have access to those easily. So uh, for the first time in probably modern history, we do need a strategy towards China, uh, because we have to make choices where we will not get benefits that might happen if we do deal more deeply with China. So that's that's a much more complicated issue. Thank you. So just the last uh, set of, I think there are two questions left. Mm -hmm. If there's two, we can maybe mm -hmm. one first and the rest. Let's take a last question together. Mm -hmm. okay. Good evening, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, I would like to ask about the Xi Jinping's way of dealing, symbolic way of dealing with the national issue. It's an issue for the European diplomats in the other countries because this will lead in uh, different meanings, successful or destructive, in dealing with uh, China. But uh, in the internal policy, is Xi Jinping dealing with the same symbolic way? Because this might lead to different meanings between policy makers. You, you mean about nationalism? About, about nationalism? Me? You mean about nationalism? Yes, uh, okay. symbolic way mm. of uh, Xi Jinping okay, is a problem yeah. for the nationals. But okay. in, the, in the internal policy, it's still symbolic. Mm. How yeah. is it dealing? Yeah. Thank okay. you. And let's take also the last one. Uh, so uh, my question was that we see generally China uh, wants to be a great power in the international system, but as you said, there is a certain passiveness from their end, and I get that what you said about the uh, the interventions and that they may, they may go bad, and that they don't want to follow U.S.'s example. Uh, but we know that uh, what a great power needs is uh, to be involved in the international system, to be a great power. So my question was, if China has what it needs and what it takes to be a great power in the international system, and whether this passiveness welcomes a more uh, multipolar international system in the future. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, just very quickly. So for nationalism, and uh, I, I mean... The problem is nationalism is the state ideology in China. I, I mean, it's pretty obvious if you aim to have a great, powerful country, it's, it's a nationalist ideology you're talking about. And for most Chinese people, Xi Jinping thought and Marxism, Leninism and socialism with Chinese characteristics are not probably things they believe in or think about. But I think that most Chinese people probably do believe in a powerful, strong country. I mean, it's... Uh, so that kind of nationalism is not a resource that Xi Jinping can ignore. Any politician would want to use that. It's hugely powerful. But of course, it's not something that the outside world likes. Um, the only issue is that in the history of nationalism uh, in modern times, we don't really know what Chinese nationalism looks like. I mean, we know Japanese nationalism ended in a very bad place. And we can probably see other examples of nationalism in the Asia-Pacific region that were unfortunate. But with China, its nationalism, again, is untested. So the problem is that you see a lot of language and a lot of, obviously, uh, uh, exaggeration. But what the reality of Chinese nationalism is and, you know, kind of the way it engages with the world, 
where you look at the actions. And broadly, China has not had active combat experience since 1979. It, the curious thing is not that China is, um, you know, kind of uh, interventionist or, 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 or kind of driven by nationalism to have conflict with others. The weird thing is that it hasn't had any conflict. It just seems not to have done that. It's got a massive army that it doesn't use, except for symbolic reasons. So I think its nationalism must be interpreted symbolically again, uh, unless something dramatic happens, which it could, and then it totally changes uh, you know, how we interpret it. Um, on the, um, I mean, a great, so yes, a great power will need to be a certain thing, but the question is how? And the idea that there is a paradigm where a great power has to be a certain thing is a massive assumption. Uh, and that assumption is built on our modern history of seeing what we think to be great powers acting in a certain way. But A, there's very little examples. We've got America, we had the USSR maybe, that's it, you know? I mean, so there's plenty of space for another paradigm. And the question of how you can be a great power, uh, I think is one that is very open-ended. I don't think China wants to be a great power in the model of the United States because I think increasingly it does not feel that the United States has been a successful model to be a great power. Therefore, I don't think it will copy it. But I think it wants to be a kind of different model um, and how it creates that model is something that's probably open-ended that we can work with, if we're willing. Thank you. All right, so please join me in thanking Professor Brown for uh, his talk and for answering all these questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.